Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us here today for the second day of our conference. It's great to be here today talk to talk to you about sustainability and why it's changing our financial services industry. Our view is that 2020 is truly a pivotal year for the ESG movement. This is the year that sustainable investing has become mainstream across all sectors in the financial industry. It has become, I think, at this point, too big for any of us to ignore. But first, before we get into the nitty gritty, let's do some level setting. Let, let's describe what sustainable investing is and what its potential is for us as, a, as an industry and as also as a society. Sustainable investing is really about understanding the material non-financial factors that drive long-term value creation by an enterprise. It holds the belief that businesses which contribute to or are able to transition their businesses towards a sustainable economy, those businesses will enjoy a comparative advantage over the long term. And what is a sustainable economy? Well, it's one that minimizes its negative impact and ideally creates positive impact on the environment and society. Features of a sustainable economy can include, but they're not limited to, reduced or in some cases negative carbon emissions, circularity in the use of our natural resources, the preservation and promotion of variety and variability of life on Earth, the fair treatment of workers and other stakeholders, producer and product responsibility, and ethical business conduct. And so really, what is it that we're trying to do? We're trying to direct capital in favor of businesses which can contribute to that sustainable economy, which in turn reduces their cost of capital, enhances their competitiveness, and facilitates a just transition from an extractive economy to a regenerative economy. And how do we seek to achieve this? Through the integration of E, S, and G factors in a long-term investment process. The E stands for environmental. I think the most well-known of these factors is climate change. This is and continues to be a very pressing issue. But as I'll talk about a little bit later, biodiversity is also becoming an equally important and pressing priority for us. On the S side, this traditionally talks about employee relationships, but this is also becoming expanded in, 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 in a post-pandemic environment. And we'll talk a little bit, we'll talk a little bit about, more about that as well. And of course, not forgetting the traditional focus on G, particularly important for the emerging markets, issues like executive pay, bribery and corruption, board diversity, minority shareholder rights. These remain at the forefront of investor minds. So let's dial back a little bit before COVID happened. This is a study that we did that, that analyzed the responses from our analysts looking at the companies that they invest in. And the question that we asked our analysts every year was, have you seen a growing emphasis among your companies to implement and communicate ESG policies? And as you can see in 2017, the majority of companies still said, not really. But fast forward to 2020, and that number is vanishingly small. The overwhelming majority of companies are now focused on disclosing and communicating ESG policies. But even more interesting, I think, is that if you look at the geographic breakdown, you'll see that this trend is true right across the world. So previously, you might have had a view that ESG is a matter for European companies or Australian companies. It was a developed market concern. But our data shows that right across the world, in China, in Japan, in Asia Pacific, in the ASEAN region, the priority on ESG has become, uh, has gone to the forefront of, of our company's minds. But COVID has turbocharged all of these trends that existed before. And part of the reason for this is because the value of ESG research and ratings has been proven through this crisis. So this is a piece of analysis that Fidelity did using its proprietary ESG ratings. Essentially, what we did was that we analyzed a six-week period at the outbreak of the initial market volatility around, around the pandemic. And what we found was a very clear correlation between the, the, the letter grade of the company's ESG rating and its relative outperformance or underperformance relative to a benchmark. And we saw that was true, that relationship was true across both equity and fixed income as well. 
We've since updated this research uh, to now take into account a longer period of time across the full nine, across the full three quarters of this year. And actually, I'm happy to say that we found that the relationship continues to exist, which I think underpins our view that ESG is a factor that works in both market volatile times in down markets, but also in the strong market recovery we've, sin we've seen since that initial period of volatility. Why is this? Fundamentally, it's because we believe that ESG factors are a leading indicator of a company's resilience and robustness. And this is because, in our view, a strong focus on sustainability by a company is a sign of a forward-looking management team who is thinking about risks and opportunities in a long-term way. And the other thing I would add is that whilst this may be obvious in retrospect that ESG was going to prove and show these characteristics of resilience and robustness, it actually wasn't always the case. Prior to this year, a lot of people had a view that ESG was a, a bull market for not, a f phenomenon. So something that people uh, uh, indulged in uh, because returns were so steady, because we'd come out of a, a, very, a very long period of, of, of exceptional growth and low interest rates. And the view was the first bear market we have, investors will discard ESG and they'll refocus on, on, on financial returns. And actually, that could not be further from the truth. ESG has now become paramount in the minds of our investors and our clients. And so in that sense, I think we can say with confidence that ESG has passed its first live test. But I think beyond proving the financial value of ESG, COVID has also had a more deeper and more profound impact than simply ESG as a tool of financial analysis. What it has done is it has refocused corporate, at corporate attention on the importance of a purpose-led business. It is a reminder to us that a company's purpose is not to generate a profit. It is to serve the needs of society by providing a valuable product or service and to do so in a way that minimizes its environmental impact and accentuates its positive societal impact. And the profit a company generates is the byproduct of a company successfully fulfilling its purpose. It is not the purpose of a company itself. And this view, this change in the view around the purpose-led approach of a company, this was encapsulated in a statement that was made by the Business Roundtable last year. So for those of you who don't know, the Business Roundtable is a private sector coalition comprising 181 CEOs of America's largest corporations. And that statement effectively overturned a 22-year-old policy that defined a corporation's principal purpose as maximizing shareholder value. Instead, the statement redefined the purpose of a, co of a corporation as delivering value to its customers, as investing in its employees, as dealing fairly with suppliers, and as supporting the communities in which they operate. It was in itself an important recognition of the fact that creating short-term and medium-term value for stakeholders is the most reliable way to create long-term value for shareholders. And so what has really happened is that the pandemic has accelerated this focus on the S factor. Whereas previously, the priorities of ESG had been on climate change and governance, really, we're now a lot of investment analysis is now really being refocused on the value of this S factor, the, so the social factor. And what is the social factor? Well, what it really is at its heart is a reflection of a company's basic societal license to operate. And in some sectors like in mining or in some jurisdictions like in China, that societal license can be explicit or typically it is more implicit in the consent of, of people in society to allow that business to operate and to generate profit. There are different ways that we can measure the S factor. I think the, most, the, the, the way that most people uh, think about is employee engagement, but it actually includes a much broader range, including things like producer responsibility, like how you're treating your suppliers, and product responsibility, like how your product is being used by and marketed to your consumers. Traditionally, these S factors have been thought of as being quite difficult to measure. You know, how, how, for example, would you quantify the culture of a company? 
But I think the rise of big data sets and alternative sources of information now allow us to find information about a company, not just information that is published by a company. And in turn, this allows us to integrate these considerations into our investment analysis and decision making. And it is also clear that this is becoming increasingly important. The risk of brand damage from companies uh, is, is now rising for those engaging in antisocial behavior. And this is especially true, of course, in consumer-facing businesses like retail and, 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 and clothing, but also increasingly from a wider range of sectors. Witness, for example, the outcry that occurred when Rio Tinto inadvertently destroyed an important First Nations cultural heritage in a Jukan Gorge, which ended up triggering the resignation of its CEO and two more senior executives. And this shift that we see from shareholder capitalism to stakeholder capitalism, this is also being reflected in what we see on the ground. So our analyst pulse survey from May of this year reveals that over the, across the world, 55% expect a greater focus on S issues from their companies going forward. And as you can see from that geographic breakdown, Asia Pacific companies are leading the way in this transformation. Anecdotally, we've also seen some very positive examples of companies changing their businesses and their production processes to adapt to society's immediate needs. Corporates all across the world have been helping to ease the challenges facing their stakeholders in many ways, increasing accessibility to products by, uh, uh, to their customers, um, expediting payments to suppliers, um, ensuring that, that suppliers still have uh, long-term contracts in place, and contributing in different ways to the global needs created by the pandemic, whether that's in more hand sanitizers or in testing equipment or in face masks. At the same time, we've seen an explosion of interest in social bonds, which have now become the fastest growing sector of sustainable finance. Some of these social bonds earmarked for vaccine development or for, de or for defraying the cost of the current crisis. But I think it's important that as we think about how we build back better and how we build more resilient and robust companies, that we don't forget that the, in that the pandemic has... Um, made worse the situation for millions of workers lower down the, the supply chain. And they are, in a real way, facing many of the worst impacts of this crisis. These workers already previously faced poverty wages, dangerous and unsafe conditions, and very few social protections. And migrant workers in supply chains have also faced unique risks, such as harsh containment measures and debt bondage. At Fidelity, we've been trying to engage with our companies to, enc to encourage positive change on these issues. And later speakers today will talk to you about some examples of the work that we've been doing. I think one particularly pressing example that we've been focused on is the fate of seafarers, 400,000 seafarers who are, who are trapped working aboard vessels and who are not permitted to embark and disembark and do crew changes because of restrictions on their travel, yet I think clearly seeing that their work is essential for our way of life. 90% of global trade moves by ships. None of us would be sitting here at home with our food, with our energy, with our security, without, without their work. Their, their solution needs a truly multilateral approach from all parts of the value chain. And equally, in the apparel and retail and textile sectors, which we'll talk about in more detail, this is a sector that is dominated by multi-tier supplier relationships, a lack of traceability uh, from, from, the, from, the, from the initial producers, from the growers of cotton, straight through to the, the garment manufacturers, the textile and, and, and dye companies, and then ultimately the retailers into our hands. And of course, very rapid market-driven changes in that, in, that, uh, in that industry, driven by rapid changes in consumer preferences. The other, S, the other S issue that we are focused on this year, and I think will become an increasingly important issue in the years to come, is around digital transformation 
or, or digital ethics, I should say. This is really what the role of the platforms is in terms of ensuring positive societal outcomes for, for, all, the, for all the users that they serve, given that so much of our lives now sit and exist on these platforms. And I think you can see that, the, that, that there are a variety of different, um, of different issues here associated with that. There is, of course, the online welfare issue, uh, the fake news dissemination, the, the traditional concerns around data privacy, uh, the, the, the embedding, the, any biases that can emerge from existing algorithms. So as we all know, algorithms are designed to drive uh, user engagement. Uh, user growth and ultimately monetization by those platforms of our uh, engagement and growth in users um, is that in turn creating the right kind of kinds of outcomes that we want to see online fraud how, how consumers can be protected from from those who would seek to use uh, the, the, the these platforms uh, for, 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 for criminal activity um, and also cyberbullying, how do we protect the teenagers, the youth of today from, from being exposed uh, to, 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 to dangerous um, uh, um, abuses? The investment risks, again, are very clear. Top of the list is future regulation. I think it's future regulation here is almost inevitable. You can see the focus by different governments uh, right, right, right around the world on this. But regulation will come too late. Companies must be encouraged to self-regulate. They have to understand for themselves that these issues that I've talked about represent existential risks to their platform, not just from regulation, but also from loss of trust from their user base itself. And so we seek to reflect our concerns to corporates and to promote that sense of, of, of regulation. These companies ha, are, are generally uh, have global reach because of the way in which they scale, because of the way in which they have low customer, customer and user acquisition costs. And so that global reach, in our view, gives them a global responsibility to promote the best societal use of their platforms. And the third and final topic that I want to address today is, um, is, 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 is I think, one that, that, that has um, also been highlighted by this pandemic. You know, in, in some ways, the reason why, the underlying root cause of why we are in the pandemic that we're in today is because we as a human society have pushed back very much on the boundaries of the natural world. And as we increasingly do that, the natural world is responding and creating feedback loops that is in turn affecting our ability to lead a sustainable society. So this quote here, I appreciate this quote, is very long. I won't read it in all. But I think the, the main point of this quote is really to say that you cannot just look at climate change as an issue in isolation. Climate change is intimately linked to many other ecological events that are happening all around the world. And now the scientific evidence is mounting that all of these events are intimately interconnected. How the loss of the Antarctic ice sheet impacts the, 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 the levels of rain and the availability of the Amazon rainforest, for example. And potentially, all of these different changes are now creating feedback loops that may be irreversible if we don't act immediately. And it is very clear that as we live through our Anthropocene era of our planet, that human activity is now eroding the world's foundations. We have caused the loss of 83% of, of wild mammals, half of all plants, three quarters of ice-free land, and two thirds of, of the marine environment have been irrevocably altered through our actions. The rate of extinction is now 10 to 100 times higher than the average over the last 10 million years, and it is accelerating faster and faster. And this is not just an ecological disaster. This is a financial disaster as well. 44 trillion of the world, or, or approximately half of the world's GDP, as estimated by the World Economic Forum, is either moderately or highly linked to the availability of natural capital. 
And this is very obvious for certain primary sectors like agriculture and construction and food and beverage. But also, this will have very significant impacts on secondary and tertiary industries as well, like pharmaceuticals, like tourism, like chemicals and materials. Given the significant financial risks that are apparent to us, the task is already underway to quantify, disclose, and assess a company's exposure to nature-based risk. And this will borrow from the very successful TCFD framework. The TCFD framework is the task force for climate change-related financial disclosures. It has become the, 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 the world's gold standard for how a company should be thinking about and then disclosing and assessing climate change-related financial risk. And that same process is now underway to, uh, to do the same for nature-based risks and ultimately to align this key issue to the broader risk management pr practices that we see from companies around the world. Ultimately, I think the underlying issue here is that we as a, as a, as a society, as an industry, need to learn how to price natural capital better. We all know that, that the finance industry doesn't value something unless we can put a price onto it. Currently, the price that we put on natural capital is the price essentially as an input of it into different processes around the world, whether that input is, is, is an animal or whether it's a tree or whether uh, it's, 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 it's another widely available resource. But what we need to learn to, 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 to now price is the sustainability of natural capital. Because simply putting these things as inputs is resulting in a process where the va their long-term value is being eroded because they cannot then be replaced. And so that now needs to be f factored into our financial models. And that is a challenge for Fidelity. That is a challenge for the financial industry over the next two to three years. I want to close uh, by talking a little bit about Fidelity's sustainable investing beliefs. So we have four core beliefs around this space at Fidelity. The first is that we believe that fundamentally incorporating these factors that I've talked about it enhances our investment returns that we can deliver to our clients. Why is this? Well, there's two main ways. Firstly, is that incorporating ESG factors in fundamental bottom-up research, in our view, leads to more complete analysis and better informed investment decisions but also encouraging management teams to raise their standards of sustainability will also lead to more robust and resilient business models and behaviors that will also deliver long-term value to our clients. Secondly, we believe in a balance of, ob of objectives. So we seek to maximize our risk-adjusted return whilst also now integrating what is being referred to as the third dimension of investing. So we have risk, we have return, and now we have impact. The, the, the impact being the recognition uh, that our financial decisions have non-financial outcomes. And the first step is to acknowledge that that, that that is true. The second is to measure what those non-financial outcomes are. And the third is to target those non-financial outcomes explicitly. And I think as I've talked about earlier, we seek to achieve a balance of rights of, uh, between us as shareholders and the interests of a issuer's broader set of stakeholders. And we do so not because we think it's altruistic or because we think it's the right thing to do, but because we think this is actually the best way for a company to generate long-term value for shareholders by paying attention to its stakeholders. Our third belief is around the local context of ESG. So a lot of these issues that I've talked about are or, are or can feel like they're top down, but actually they're not. A lot of them, you need to think about it in a local market context. You need to address it in a bottom up way, recognizing that ESG factors will vary by industry, by geography and by business model. And finally, how do we want to implement this? So as a firm, Fidelity strongly prefers engagement over exclusion because we believe that the value is in, is, in proving, is in working with our issuers to improve their focus on sustainability and their stakeholder responsibilities. Exclusion simply transfers that problem to another part of the financial uh, ecosystem, whether that's uh, the private equity or distressed debt buyers who may or may not have um, those, those, the, uh, uh, those, those same sets of incentives that we feel that we have as long-term investors. And finally, that we seek to collaborate. 
we, we, we seek to be part of industry movements, to, 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 to collaborate with our, with our clients, with our peers, with civil, with civil society organizations, to influence and achieve better outcomes. And so our beliefs lead to our approach to sustainable investing. We seek to integrate sustainability into our investment research platform and into the way that we engage with companies and select securities. We seek to uh, conduct sustainability research and ratings by our fundamental research team across our entire universe of approximately 4,000 issuers. We have an active stewardship program to work with companies and with regulators to improve their sustainable footprint and create better societal and financial value. We seek to create sustainability solutions to our clients that enable them to achieve their objectives. And finally, and, and, and not forgetting this, uh, we seek to improve our own corporate sustainability, looking at how Fidelity as a firm can improve its own footprint, have its own net zero ambitions. And so really, I want to leave you with this one final thought. This is, this is, a, this is a cartoon. It's, look, it looks lighthearted, but, but it's not really. It, you know, what it shows really is that you know, as we as we combat this pandemic today, we shouldn't forget that there is a larger, uh, pressing, bigger societal challenge that faces all of us as an industry, as a society. That challenge is, of course, climate change. And that focuses our minds and our attentions on finding the value and opportunities in our post-pandemic world.